Welcome, I'm Terry Soule and this is Programming Chaos, a channel devoted to fun and interesting programming projects to help you hone your programming skills. Today I'm going to be talking about an evolutionary version of 3D particle life. So as you can see here, we have a 3D model or a 3D environment in which we have these little creatures that swim around and collect food. And you can see the olive particles there that they're collecting are the food particles. And the reason they're good at that is because they've been evolving over time. And so, as I said, this is an evolutionary model. This is not something I programmed in in terms of their behaviors. This is something that has evolved. And the basics of the model, which I'll talk about in more detail in a little bit, is they need to collect food in order to get enough energy to reproduce and pass on their genes. And if they fail to collect enough food, they starve and die out. And so that's the basics of the evolution. In terms of the model for the creatures, as you can see, there are a collection of particles, 3D particles in this case, that are held together by forces. And it's those forces that evolve over time. And so we have a variety of creatures you can see sort of swimming around here. And they have all evolved to be able to collect food. So you see as food particles get near, they orient towards them and collect them. It almost looks like they have little mouth parts, but that's more or less coincidence. And in order to understand this better, we need to take a closer look at exactly how the particle model works. So let's do that now. The basic idea for both the 2 and the 3D versions of particle life is that there are different types of particles represented by colors, and those particles are either attracted or repelled by each other. And we're also ignoring Newton's third law, which says for every force there is an equal and opposite force. And that's critical to getting the interesting behaviors that we do out of particle life models. So for example, we might have a set of rules that says red particles are attracted to blue particles and blue particles are repelled by red particles. And that gives us sort of a continuous motion of one chasing the other. That would not be the case if we were talking about real physical forces. For example, if you had a spring between them, they'd be, have an equal and opposite attraction. In particle life, we don't worry about that. It's the nice thing about being able to write our own code. We can make up our own laws of physics. We will add a rule that says that very close particles always repel each other, so they don't just clump up into sort of uninteresting blobs. And what you can see is it gives us the sort of behavior we see in our creatures. So for example, red particles are attracted to each other, so they cluster a little bit, but they are also attracted to the pink particles, but the pink particles are repelled by the red particles, and so we get this interesting movement behavior. If you're interested in programming the non-evolutionary version of either 2 or 3D particle life, I've got some videos that walk through the whole programming process, which I will link up above here. In order to better understand how this works, we've got to actually look at how the forces change over distance. And so here's the model for that. So we have our forces based on the distance. And as I said, up close, there's always a force that repels two particles. So if the blue particle gets too close to the red particle, it definitely gets repelled. We also have a second force, which I'm calling the attractive force, although it could be negative, so it could also be a repelling force. And it also applies to every pair of particles. And a particle, for example, the blue particle here, is influenced by the red particle through both of those forces. And so we really look at the sum of those two forces. So if the blue particle gets close, it's going to feel a negative or repelling force. If it's a particular distance away, those forces balance out and we get an equilibrium point. And then as the blue particle moves further away, in this example at least, it will start being attracted to the red particle. So the blue particle on its own will be attracted up until it gets to this point, and then it reaches an equilibrium. If it goes closer, it'll be pushed away and so it wants to sort of hover that far away from the red particle in this particular example. The red particle, however, feels a completely different set of forces. It may want to get even closer to the blue particle, 
And so if the red particle gets closer than the equilibrium, the blue will start to run away and then we get that nice motion. The key here is every pair of particle types feels its own set of forces defined by their own max distance. And so what we end up with is two tables, one for the strengths of those forces and the other for the distances associated with the forces. So for example, in this case, red particles are attracted to blue because that's a positive number, but blue particles are repelled by red particles because that's a negative number. And the distance over which those forces apply depends on the values in this second table. So that's the basic idea behind all particle life. If we want an evolutionary model, things get a little more complicated. So what we have to define is what represents an organism. And so for my model, an organism consists of N, which happens to be 40 particles. So what we see here are 40 particles that make up one sort of organism. And there are two sets of rules. So there are the set of rules for how these particles interact with each other. Think of those as the self rules. And if we want, we could think of these particles as cells. So it's the forces that hold the cells together. And that's a table of strengths and another table of distances. And then we have a second set of rules for how these cells or these particles interact with the particles of other organisms, including food. And so in this model, altogether, there are five particle types. The first four are the ones that make up an organism. And you can see in this case, they happen to be orange, red, green, and yellow. And then the fifth type is the food. So that's just another particle type. And so these tables are five by five tables for the five particle types. And those sets of strengths and distances basically make up an organism's genome that defines how the organism holds together and how it interacts with the environment. In addition, it turns out that the forces alone are not enough. You need to sort of configure the particles in the right initial locations so that they form whatever pattern is effective. The forces alone can lead to lots of different patterns. It's sort of like saying, not only do we need the forces that hold your cells together, we also need to know where your cells are located. And so the initial positions of the particle are also part of the genome. And then in order to visualize the creatures, the organisms a little better, they can evolve a single color. That's sort of their base particle color. It's somewhere on the color wheel, so a value between zero and 360. And then the other particles are arbitrarily set to be 20 degrees away from that. So what you'll notice is all of the organisms have fairly similar colors because they're on a particular slice of the color wheel, but where that slice is depends on the gene for their base color. So we can think of this as an organism that has this genome that consists of a bunch of genes defining how its own particles interact and how it interacts with the rest of the world. And then we simply drop it into the environment and let it run around. And if it does a good job of collecting food particles, it gets to reproduce. We make a copy of it and we copy its genes over and there's a mutation step. So the genes get randomly mutated a little bit and we get a similar but not identical organism. And then those now, in a sense, compete with each other because they're both out there trying to get food and the ones that get the most food, again, get to reproduce and pass their genes on. And of course, if they fail to collect food, then they starve to death and they don't get to pass their genes on. So that's the basics of the evolutionary model. And what we'll see is that it leads to all sorts of interesting, complicated behavior. So let's take a look at some of the creatures that can evolve. It's worth mentioning that the environment that these creatures evolve and live in is basically a three-dimensional toroidal fish tank. So it's three-dimensional, and if they leave one side, they come in on the other side. And you'll occasionally see them sort of disappearing and reappearing as they move around, and that's them moving from one side to the other. This is an example of an initial population. So this is 50 completely random creatures before evolution has started. 
and you'll notice that there's a wide range of behaviors, a lot of which are probably not very effective for collecting food, and a wide range of colors because they're all starting with a random base color. You may also notice some creatures that sort of appear to explode and die. I've put in a rule that if within a creature any two particles get too far apart, both of the particles die and the creature loses some energy. So there's an evolutionary pressure to at least somewhat hold together. In contrast, you'll notice after 10 hours of evolution, all of that diversity has disappeared. That's because of the competitive exclusion principle in what is a very simple environment. If there's one type that slightly outperforms another type in terms of collecting food, the competitive exclusion principle says that given enough time, that slightly better type is going to completely dominate the population and the other type will die out. The other thing that we see is they have evolved very good avoidance behavior. So you can see when they get close to each other, they turn away. And this is presumably so that they're more effective at collecting food. There's no point in trying to collect food when you're right next to another organism. It's better to avoid them and go off and find food on your own. And as you can see, they're pretty good, although occasionally they have to do two or three passes at collecting food. Another interesting thing to notice is that the attraction to food for these creatures seems to be guided primarily by the pink particles in front, which makes sense. You can see that those are the particles that are being pulled towards the food and the rest of the particles sort of follow behind. That's not the only behavior we observe, however. For example, this is the result of another evolutionary run, and if you watch closely, it looks like the red particles in back are more repulsed by food, and that's what causes the creature to orient facing the food. You'll also notice that they've evolved a much more wobbly structure, not as fixed as the previous run. So different evolutionary runs create completely different outcomes. Here's one with structured ring shapes. And you'll often see fairly wide shapes like these rings because they're helpful for collecting food. And you can see when it gets close to food, it orients on it quite effectively. And there's a combination that we often see of clumps near the middle, which in a sense are the motive force, and then other particles that are strongly attracted to food. One of the reasons we get these very well-defined creatures is because, as I said, if they spread out too much, that is two particles within a creature get too far apart, those particles are deleted from the individual and they lose some food. So there's evolutionary pressure for them to stay clumped together in sort of what we would think of as traditional organisms. However, we can remove that rule and let them spread out as much as we want. And let's see what evolves in that case. So here I've removed the restriction that if two particles are too far apart, they die. And all of those individual particles you see scattered everywhere are not food particles. Those are particles of organisms that have sort of come into existence and then exploded to fill the map. And when a food particle does appear, almost instantaneously, the particles around it come in and grab it. We also see some secondary structures moving around. Those no longer consist of all 40 particles in an organism. They're a subset, maybe 10 or 15. And I'm not sure what evolutionary role they play. Maybe they're a secondary way of collecting food, or maybe given enough time, they would evolve away as well. And all we would see was individual isolated particles. This is why I find evolutionary models so exciting. They give you endless new worlds to explore. If you find anything interesting, please feel free to put a comment down below. And in the meantime, happy exploring.